It's the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network, brought to you, of course, by the good folks at Casamigos Tequila. Casamigos Tequila is brought to you by those who drink it. On this Memorial Day Monday, a special podcast. Before I get to it, though, let me first uh, wish everybody a very uh, happy Memorial Day and remember what Memorial Day is about remembering those who have uh, made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. And we uh, think back and take time to pay tribute to all those that gave their lives through all the wars that have, you know, dotted our time. And also for anyone who uh, made their service. And so uh, we think of those that, were fortunate enough to come back and those that weren't fortunate enough to come back. So uh, on this Memorial Day, um, this is a special podcast and one I wasn't expecting to do, but uh, I really felt compelled when I got the news. And um, I was inside in my office doing some work. It's a rainy day. And uh, Jack came down and said, Dad, you see Bill Walton died. And I'm like, what? And I was absolutely stunned. I mean, I didn't even know Bill was sick. Um, I got to know Bill through the years when I was at CBS, uh, and he became a broadcaster. Everybody knew Bill. I mean, I don't think there's anybody who didn't know Bill. Uh, I don't think there's anybody in broadcasting that didn't know Bill. I don't know anybody who had an interview show that didn't have Bill on at one time or another as he became one of the real colorful characters in all of sports casting a guy who as a player was very quiet because he had a stuttering problem and you know was almost reclusive in those times uh it was a different era to begin with but this was to me uh one that really was shocking number one i did i did not know that he was ill i did not know that he was suffering uh and battling cancer um, as we think about these days, 71 is not old. You say that because, I mean, when we hit close to that age, hey, you don't think of yourself as being old, and you do see more and more people pass, but 71 is still relatively uh, early. He did have a rich, full life, but... This was one of the really unique characters, but talking especially to those who never got a chance to see him, his was a very, very different career because it was almost like a comet across the sky. He was not healthy often. He was not healthy for very long. But when he was at his best, when he was healthy, which turned out to be rare, but the UCLA days, a couple of years in Portland, back up on the 86 team, but again, he didn't have to put in the minutes in that that situation uh, with the Celtics, but when you go back and think of Walton, you think of this incredible, dominant, fiery player who had one of the great, greatest, if not the greatest college careers of all time. And I say this, and if you're listening to this and you didn't get to see Bill Walton play, go look at some video from his days in Portland. And they're there, it's there. Go look at some video from his days at UCLA. Uh, There's plenty of that, too, and you will see what I'm talking about. When he was at full strength and healthy, he was the most complete center who ever lived. He would rank rank with the greatest centers of all time, with Wilt, with Russell, with Kareem, with any of them. And he had no weaknesses. He was a beautiful passer. He could score. He was a brilliant defender, a shot blocker, threw an incredible outlet pass, was a beautiful passer in, in the in the half-court sets, and really 
did not have a weakness in his game. But all he thought about was the game in its purest context, that the game be played properly, and that it be all about the team and winning. And few people experience winning more. Now, he did win two championships in the NBA, one as the lead figure, the other one as a backup with that great 86 Celtic team. But you go back to his days. This was a player who experienced things that players could only dream about. From Now, he had injuries dating back to when he was a youngster. And he wasn't even completely healthy in, in high school, which held him back a little bit. But from the time he stepped on the court as a junior at Helix High in San Diego to the time... He left UCLA. He did not lose an organized game from the start of his junior year in high school till halfway through his senior year in college. He suffered no defeats. Zero. He won his last 49 games in high school. He won his first 88 games he won his uh, first 88 games with UCLA. He wins, he wins 30 and 0, 30 and 0, and then lost at Notre Dame later. UCLA win streak was 88 games in a row. They lost four games as seniors. They lost no games as sophomores, no games as juniors, and then senior year. And that team became. A little hard to handle. They had the lost weekend in Oregon. They lost to Oregon and Oregon State on the same weekend. They lost at Notre Dame, which was the losing of the streak. Walton had a bad back. They lost that game. And then they lost in the semifinal to NC State, which went undefeated that year and won the national championship when Walton was a senior. Three-time player of the year, two-time champion, et cetera, et cetera. Now... First couple of years in the Portland, he was, that was a different time in his life. I mean, he was kind of counterculture. He was living a different lifestyle. He was also hurt a lot. But then he got back to basketball, and his Portland team won a championship, beating the Sixers in six games, sweeping the Lakers in four games, then beating the Sixers in six games. And he was utterly brilliant in the championship series winning the finals MVP, and the next year, they were even better. With Walton in the lineup, before he shattered the foot and started that long litany of years where he was not able to play and had all the problems with doctors and lawsuits and everything else that dotted his career, that next year, that Portland team was amazing. They were 50 and 5 at one point that year with him in the lineup. 50 and 5 in the NBA. That's how dominant he was. And he was never really healthy again, although he had minutes in Boston where he played that, you know, super sub role for that great 86 championship team with the Celtics. That was, of course, led by Larry Bird. But this was one of the great players and maybe the greatest college player of all time. I know a lot of coaches who felt that he was Denny Crum, who recruited him at UCLA when he was an assistant to John Wooden before he went off to have his own, all his success, said he was the greatest high school player he ever laid eyes on. Many coaches proclaimed him the greatest college player who ever played. And in the championship game, in the non dunk years, that were started because of Kareem and continued through his time at UCLA. He in the championship game, think about this, in the championship game against Memphis in his junior year, he scored 44 points in the championship game, 21 of 22 from the floor. He went 2 for 5 from the foul line for 44 points. 
had 13 rebounds in 33 minutes of play in their route over Memphis, but he went 21 of 22 in a championship game. Think about scoring 40 points in a championship game. Then think about missing one shot in the game. This is a guy who, in high school, as a senior, set an all-time high school record. He made 78.3% of his field goals for the season. 78.3. Still holds the national record. I mean, you're talking about one of the really one of the greatest players when healthy who ever lived, but it was such a short, fleeting time because he had such enormous problems and then really nagging problems that followed him for years and years. They had fused his ankles and all kinds of crazy stuff with his feet and just so many broken bones, and it was just awful. So there was so much frustration because here was this dominant figure who would have been without question, one of the greatest players who ever stepped on an NBA court. If he had ever stayed healthy, he didn't. But at least he had his moments. He won a championship going through Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and the Lakers, going through Julius Irving and Daryl Dawkins and the Sixer team to win the championship. And he played brilliantly in the finals. And then winning another one later on in 86, years later when everyone thought he was done. And he was done as a primetime player, but he played a super sub role on that great Celtic team and won a championship there with one of the great teams of all time, the 86 Celtics. He went on to overcome his stuttering problem. And as we know, became one of the real characters as a broadcaster. You never knew what he was going to say. You know, he was this counterculture, you know, Grateful Dead. I mean, he used to take off all the time and follow the Grateful Dead everywhere. He'd sing with Jerry Garcia. I mean, he was friends with the Grateful Dead. He, you know, he, he was the ultimate deadhead and, you know, the whole thing. He was, you know, lived the lifestyle that was part of the time and was a very different, different, but very full of life, colorful character who became really one of the very different broadcasters we've ever had, to be honest with you. You, you, would, you would listen to him on a Pac-10 game or a Pac-12 game, I should say. And you didn't know what he was going to say or what he was talking about or where it was going to come from. I mean, it could be about anything. You know, he was out there in the ozone somewhere, but people loved it. You know, it's funny. His, his brother played for the Cowboys. And I believe, somebody could look this up, but I believe they're the only brother tandem in history that won a Super Bowl, as Bruce Walton did as a member of the Cowboys, as an offensive lineman, and an NBA championship as brothers. I don't think anybody else ever did that. It's a kind of an odd combination. And I, I believe they're the only brothers to do that, but someone might find that it's happened somewhere else. I don't know. But I think they're the only brothers that have ever done that. But... uh the sports world, I think, was really stunned today by this, not expecting it, number one. You know, when people get into their late 80s or 90s now, you think about, hey, I have to have something ready for when this iconic figure, you know, passes or whenever, you know, depending on who the person might be. We do that in sports. We've always you know, prepare, sports departments do that all the time. They prepare the people who they want to have stuff available, you know, who reach a certain age. No one was prepared for Bill Walton. And I don't even know that most people 
even though he was was ill. I, I sure didn't. I've never heard him mention that he was fighting cancer. I, I, he might have kept it very private. I just had someone um, recently who was a friend of ours who never told anybody and passed away. And he never mentioned to anybody that he was sick. And he had been battling cancer for a year. He just kept it to himself. So there's people who do go about it that way. I did not know Bill was sick. Um, you know, it's a great loss to the sports community. And obviously you remember him here today as one of these, what he was, which was one of the real giants of the sport. And like I said, if he was before your time, you might not know that much about Bill. He just might be a name from the history books. And if you're a college basketball fan, you've seen things about the Walton gang and the great UCLA run and everything else. Uh, maybe you've seen the you know documentary they've had on him. If not, go watch it. Because you will see, if you watch Jokic now, there's some Walton in there. They, you know, some of the things that I see from Jokic are stuff that I saw from Walton in his heyday, in terms of his passing, in terms of what he can do to advance the offense. Walton was a beautiful passing big man. He would much rather make a great pass than, than make a basket. I mean, he was a scorer, but he was not a scorer the way Kareem was a scorer. But he was a much more ferocious defender than Kareem and a much better rebounder than Kareem. He was a very complete center. There's really nothing he couldn't do. He could do anything that could be done on a basketball floor. He could do it. He could make a jump shot. He could go to the basket. He had the big man portfolio that you need. He was an exquisite passer. He threw one of the great outlet passes. When you think of outlet passes, you think of Wes Unseld, you think of Bill Walton. Throwing the great outlet pass on a fast break. Getting the rebound and snapping it before he even hits the ground. Incredibly gifted player, and and really before his time, in what he brought to the position. And he went on to have a second career where you can find plenty of tape of him saying all kinds of crazy things as a broadcaster because he was out there. We had him on sometimes, and you, you never knew what was going to come out of his mouth. You know, he was always all over the place. But it was usually, you know, very light, always with a, you know, happy-go-lucky touch. He was, you know, he, he was a very positive, very, you know, love-life kind of guy. Very positive about everything. Did wonders for John. You know, he worshipped his coach and really kept his coach alive. Because when John Wooden was in his later years and his wife Nell had passed, Bill went and spent days with him every single week. Took him out, took him to lunch, took him out and about. He dedicated so much of his time to Coach Wooden in his later years. Because he... And he was probably the one who, in his senior year, probably gave Wooden, you know, as many sleepless nights as Wooden possibly had, as anybody could have who won as many championships as he won. Their senior team, which was so ultra-talented, just kind of went off the beaten path that year and was kind of probing and testing and, you know, learning things that clearly distracted from their uh, life on the court. If, if winning could ever become boring, I think it had for that team when they were seniors because they had experienced nothing but victories their whole lives. But Bill Walton gone, hard to say, at the age of 71. May he rest in peace. And boy, I tell you, 
Stunning news. Really is. You know, really is. I, I just think uh, sometimes it takes you by a surprise, you know. Today it definitely did. But he's someone that should be remembered for his uh, greatness on the court. I mean, what he did in college was really remarkable. And his imprint on the NBA and the center position was clear. It was profound, even though it was fleeting because of so many years that he spent injured. He made his mark even though uh, it could have been so much more. I mean, he was that prolific. So may he rest in peace. A um, couple other things while we have you. Uh, I think if you're going to win a championship, you have to have games like the Rangers had yesterday where you just know that you were able to steal a game where you got outplayed. You're not going to be at your best every night. And this team is, I mean, they're clearly equals with the Rangers having an edge in in net and maybe Florida having a slightest of edges elsewhere, but very small. I mean, these are two very equal teams, and these games are probably all going to be this way. But you saw one team just completely take over the game in the last 25 minutes or so of play or right around there. And still, in an instant, overtime goes. And they knew yesterday that they got out of there with one. The third game can often be pivotal. I mean, hard to see this series not going the full distance. I think it probably will. I mean, they these this Florida team is very, very good. But that was a game that... If they win it, and now they're six games, six wins away from a championship, they will remember that one. They'll think of these last two, the pressure they had when they went to overtime, already down a game at home, not, not daring to go two games down to this team and getting the win there, and then getting the overtime win yesterday. And the Rangers obviously have had an incredible fortune in overtime this year in the playoffs. But that was one they just flat stole. I mean, they just absolutely, they got some incredible goaltending, but they just flat stole that game yesterday because they, they got as outplayed as, about as badly as you can get outplayed in, in the latest stages of that game. I mean, they were dominated, and they still won. It's amazing sometimes the way it, it, the way it goes, especially in that sport where just, you know, one bounce, one deflection, you know, and it's over. But that was a big, big win yesterday. So, I mean, one that you will look back on if this turns out the way you hope it does. And now halfway to a Stanley Cup final. And in the NBA, we don't have much to look forward to now except uh, finishing this thing off and getting uh, Boston and Dallas on the court for the NBA Finals, which should be, I think, very competitive now that both series are pretty much tucked away, all but the formalities to be finished. And as far as baseball goes, as the Yankees continue uh, on, on the West Coast, day off on Memorial Day, which I, you know, is always a pet peeve. I don't understand. I do not understand how baseball gives teams off on holidays. I mean, Memorial Day is is their day. Why would you not take advantage of it? I mean, it makes it just makes no sense to have anybody off on Memorial Day. Absolutely. Memorial Day, 4th of July, Labor Day, those are baseball holidays. Take advantage of them. 
market them. Baseball does such a poor job in that regard. I've always felt what they should do is cut out off days around them and have those three holidays. And on those days, give your fan bases, make sure everybody plays, and play double headers. Let families take their kids to two games, get a bargain for once. You know, when we were young, when I was young and had my two brothers, Marty obviously was 20 months younger than me, and John was six and a half years older than me. So John could drive when we were still kids. And he would, you know, as you might have heard through the years, I didn't have a dad, so... um He would pack us up and when he was 17, 18, and he'd say, hey, let's go on Sunday. We'd go to doubleheaders. And we would go, even though we were really Yankee fans, we would go to the Yankees. We would go to the Mets. And we would just go early on Sunday, get there early, get tickets, no matter where they were, and sit through a doubleheader. And he must have taken us, I can't think of how many times in those years where he took us to doubleheaders. I can remember going in 62, one of the only two times I ever went to the polo grounds. The other one was with my Little League team. That I went in 63 with my Little League team to see the Pirates. In 62, John took me to the game. And for some reason, Marty wasn't with us that time. And we saw Cincinnati and Pete Rose in a doubleheader. And I still remember that doubleheader with Pete Rose playing at the Polo Grounds. Never got to see Ebbets Field, unfortunately, but I did get to see the Polo Grounds twice uh, before they started at, at Shea, which was in 64. And I remember on Labor Day, 1964, Labor Day Monday, took me to the doubleheader at Yankee Stadium against the Chicago White Sox. And the Yankees were playing a five-game series against the White Sox, and they stormed into first place by sweeping the White Sox all five games in what was the last year of the dynasty. The last big year Mantle had. The last time the Yankees won the World Series until 1976. And that Labor Day Monday, he took me to see the White Sox. And I still remember, I sat right inside the foul pole in the top deck in the first row of left field. And everyone was yelling at the White Sox left fielder, Dave Nicholson, who was a big right-handed hitter who struck out a lot. They call him Swish Nicholson. And Juan Pizarro pitched one of the games. And Mantle hit a shot up the left center field gap that hit the 457 sign. It bounced one hop to the 457. And he hit a ringing double all the way up the gap in left center field uh, against Juan Pizarro. I still remember that to this day. And seeing the guys on the White Sox, Nicholson and Jim Landis, and uh, the Yankees swept that doubleheader and moved into first place. And they had a you know really close pennant race that year with the Orioles and the White Sox. And what was the last heyday? You know, Havistan wrote a book about '64, the changing of the guard, the Yankees getting old, the American League letting the Yankees get old, teams not trying to help the Yankees in trades anymore. The Yankees not being able to pluck anybody they wanted because of the, now they had the draft. Also, the National League had integrated far earlier and now was getting dominant because they had the black and the Latin player and the American League did not. They were still kind of white, especially the Yankees and the Red Sox. And how the changing of the guard was 64. One of the great World Series. But I remember going on that Labor Day. I remember John taking me to, to those games. You know that? And I remember him taking us to Shea Stadium a couple of years later. 
and seeing the Giants in a doubleheader and Willie McCovey hitting one past the flagpole. And I'm so thankful I got to see, you know, because I didn't get to go to a lot of games in those days. You know, we didn't have a lot of money. And, you know, my mother was working. She didn't have time to take us. And we didn't get to a lot of baseball games. But I remember going to those doubleheaders. I can still remember Cincinnati at the Polo Grounds, White Sox at Yankee Stadium, Giants and the Mets at Shea Stadium. I can remember going to these doubleheaders on Sunday. And... That's where they missed the mark so dramatically. Even if they had the smarts to have some family value packs that they put together for those three dates, for Memorial Day, for the 4th of July, and for Labor Day, where families or guys or people can take their kids, boys and girls, I'm not trying to exclude girls here, and... You build baseball fans that way. You cultivate people to the sport that way. I remember going to those games when I was a kid. I remember those doubleheaders even now. And I've been to thousands of games since then, but I still remember those games and what it meant to go to those games. And, you know, how how much it shaped your you know, not only your involvement with the sport, but also just you got a chance to see and remember all these players in their prime. You know, I remember watching Willie McCovey. I remember watching Dick Allen, who was incredibly talented and powerful, and him hitting a ball out basically in the street at Chase Stadium. And all these different players that we got to see through the years. Seeing Pete Rose when he was a baby. Seeing Duke Snyder in a Met uniform. I got to see Duke Snyder. I would never have seen Duke Snyder play. But he was a Met. And I got to see Duke Snyder. Pete Rose. You know, obviously Mantle, who I only got to see a handful of times. I mean, if I saw him in person five times in my life, I was lucky. I don't even know if I saw him five times. Probably did, maybe four or five. Remember seeing him against the Washington Senators once? Remember seeing him against the Cleveland Indians once? And Mudcat Grant, Whitey Ford pitched that game. I remember seeing him against the Baltimore Orioles once. First game I ever went to, he hit a home run. I remember that very well. And same thing going, but we went to we went to the Mets too. If they had a doubleheader, we went there. Even though the Mets weren't very good. But you were getting to see those great National League players. And you were getting two games for the price of one. And that's why it irks me on Memorial Day when teams are off. And it irks me that they don't take advantage of this. And let I'm telling you, families would jump at this. Big reason they don't take their kids to the games is because it's expensive. It's really expensive to take your kids to the ballpark. I mean, parking and tickets and, you know, and I understand, you know, you don't have to, you know, eat, you know, 10, you know, burgers and drink $10 beers. I understand that. But still, it's expensive day for a family that might not have that much. But think about it, that couple of times in a year where they can get a break on a ticket and put together a package where, you know, even make parking more reasonable you can come with, it's a way to cultivate young fans. They're always trying to get to the young fans. They're always trying to hit certain nerves. You know, and this is about the best way you can do it. Because those games 
that you go to, whoever you might go with. I went with an older brother. You might go with your dad. You might go with an uncle. Who, who knows? Or your mother might take you. Who knows what this family situation is? But whatever it is, I guarantee you, you will be able to tell me about that game 50 years from now. It'll be that, it'll be that etched in your consciousness and in your memory. And that's why I think they really missed the boat because these are their holidays. Memorial Day, 4th of July. Labor Day. Those are baseball holidays. And baseball, today, Mets are playing at 4 o'clock, weather permitting. Yeah, the Dodgers are in town. But the Yankees aren't even playing. You know, I, I didn't count how many teams were off today. But there's definitely teams off. And it just makes no sense to me. It really doesn't. It's just not the way you want to market the sport. It really isn't. Right now, there are how many? It's it's three thirty in the afternoon, and there are three games active in baseball right now. That's it. Three games. Oh, the Met game was already postponed anyway. Okay, I just see it was postponed. But think about it. It just makes no sense. It's just, it's just a lost opportunity. And there, especially when you're always looking at ways to get to the kids. This is one way to do it. We'll see you later. Thanks for listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network.